All right, Auto 2, today we're going to begin speaking to you about engine fundamentals, where we're going to be looking at all kinds of um, components of an engine. A little bit of it will be Auto 1 review, but a lot more in-depth here in Auto 2. Um, what you're looking at is a nice exploded view of a BMW six-cylinder that BMW has used forever. Um, and I think I mentioned to you, but if I didn't, uh, Toyota is going to remake the the Supra, and it's going to be a inline six-cylinder, which is pretty atypical. The original ones years ago were inline six-cylinders that were uh, longitudinal, running front to back, and they were rear-wheel drive. I do not know if this one's going to be transverse and front-wheel drive or not, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. So let's talk about engines. So first, let's talk about the engine block, um, some basic components there. I do apologize that some of the words are not entirely focused real well, and that's just the nature of the the format here. Um, I will try and adjust this just a little bit and see if that helps at all. Um, but in any case, you've got an engine block here, this one being a V8, and of course they're just showing one cylinder here with a por portion of a crankshaft connecting rod, pistons, and rings. So um, yeah, there's the deck of the block, deck of the block here, the cylinder here, cylinders, water jackets in here, water jackets in here. This one's got, both of these actually have camshaft bores in the block where the camshaft slides on in. Um, and the crankcase being that lower area down around the crankshaft, etc. So, like it says, forms the main body of the engine. And we notice there on the bottom it says, we call it a short block when it's in the stage of assembly where the, the crankshaft rods and pistons are included. So that was what we call a short block. So a few more parts here, lots more parts. So first the cylinders, sorry. First the cylinders, they'll come up. Yeah, it wants to come up together. That is holes machined through the block for the pistons. You guys know that. Here's a Honda four-cylinder. Look, it's got a water jacket that goes all the way around the cylinder. So obviously they're really trying to deal with heat on that small engine. You can see the water jackets in this on this V8 uh, Ford engine. And you guys know that the water jackets are cooling passages to extract some of that 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit combustion chamber temperature and, and take it out via the coolant to the radiator where it's expelled to the environment. So the soft plugs or freeze plugs, or what's also known as core plugs, but you'll normally hear me call it freeze plugs here, freeze plugs, they are the metal plugs that seal the entrance into the water jackets. They're there for a couple of reasons. One, when they sand cast blocks, they have to be able to remove those um, so that they, or sorry, they have to be able to have access to get the sand out of the casting and then seal them up with a plug. And it also gives us access to later clean um, inside the water jackets. So um, here's a brass freeze plug set. We like the brass or treated steel because they tend not to rust out. Some of the factory style ones, if people didn't change their coolant, would rust out and you would get coolant leaks on the side of the engine, etc. So next on a block is the main bearing bores and the main caps. The main bearing bore is the hole that's machined into the block formed on the lower side by the block itself and formed on the upper side by the cap itself. This one being a four bolt main cap block. So this would be a, a performance um, small block Chevy or big block Chevy. I can't quite tell. It is definitely a Chevrolet engine. Um, and um, on the small blocks anyways, the, and I think it's true on the big blocks, the front and rear caps always have um, uh, two bolt mains. And then the center three or four bolt mains. So really important if we're going to spin the engine fast, six or 7,000 RPM high performance or race engine to have the four bolts. Um, to really secure that crankshaft. Believe it or not, that crank will start flexing at high RPM unless it's bolted down and retained really, really well. So the main bearing bores are the holes, where the, or the saddles as we call them, where the crank goes. The caps are what form the top half of that um, and hold the bearing inserts. So the crankshaft itself, and that's a very pretty crank in the picture and it's focusing well on there. Uh, this crank is, is knife edge to a certain degree. You can see the sort of chamfer off of here and chamfer off of there, which helps it as it goes through uh, the oil to, to not get so much parasitic drag. Um, you know that the crankshaft's going to harness our downward force of the 
explosion that's pushing on the piston. And we're going to be changing reciprocating motion of the pist pistons into rotating motion of the crankshaft with the piston connecting rod and with the piston connecting rod. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, piston connecting rod and crankshaft itself. So the pistons is moving up and down in a reciprocating motion. The rods going around like this on the crankshaft and converting it to rotary motion. All right, so that's kind of auto one ish. Let's keep going. So crankshaft parts. So we've got a snout up here with a woodruff key to lock on our crank gear and our harmonic balancer. So um, I don't have a crank gear separately right up here right now, but I do have a harmonic balancer here that you can see now. And that guy is to dampen out any oscillations of, um, of the crankshaft. And um, you can notice that we've got our counterweighting here, 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 and here, so that when the rod and piston combination goes up, the counterweight goes down to balance out the weight being thrown in one direction. These are our main journals, the round parts here. These are our rod journals, round parts there. And a flange back here for where the uh, flywheel or flex plate bolt on. Okay, just showing that when the rod piston combination is up at top dead center, the weight's going to be down at bottom dead center. When the piston comes down, the weight goes up. And the clearance there for, between that counterweight and that piston is super close, actually. Um, kind of a cool picture. So counterweights offset piston rod weight to prevent vibration. Next, on the crankshaft, and again, let's hopefully that will focus a little bit better, because right now it is not focusing good. Let's try and see what we can do. There we go. Got it to focus. Cool. Um, so as you look at this crank, first you can see that this has a, a crank gear here, but it's actually got another gear. So um, this, it, I'm not 100% sure. One may be driving a gear drive, and that does look like a gear drive. Um, one of them may be driving a gear drive uh, for the cams, but also one may be driving an oil pump. I'm not sure on that engine, um, but you can see it's counterweighting and so on. The snout up here sticks through the front of the block, comes out the, the um, timing cover, and that's used for putting on the harmonic bouncer, but also all of our accessory drive pulleys to run our belts, etc. On the back side, and these are two small block Chevys. This is an early one up until 1986, and then 86 and newer here. We used to use a two-piece seal, and we used to have some counterweighting on this back flange. Uh, small block Chevys, uh, 5.7 liters in particular, were notorious for leaking. So they machined the back flange completely round to use a full annular seal with no break in it. And the consequence of that full annular seal is that um, it doesn't leak as much. Well, when you machine this full round like this and you lose this counterweighting, now we've got to put some counterweighting on the flywheel or flex plate, and that's what Chevrolet did. So um, this one had a, what we call a neutral balance flex plate or flywheel, and this one has a weighted one. There's a big giant weight on it to provide some uh, additional counterweighting for that crankshaft. And again, that's just to offset the rod piston combination and to smooth out the engine's vibration. So the crankshaft flange, as we were just saying, is where the mounts, the flywheel or flex plate. Flywheel on a manual transmission car, flex plate on an automatic transmission car. So let's talk about engine bearings. So we should have rod, main, and cam bearings. It tells us um, there that the removable inserts between the main bores and the main journals. And um, here's a set of main bearings here. This set has some what we call um, insert flanges for uh, the thrust. These are called thrust washers, but they're inserts to keep the crankshaft from moving forward or rearward. This is a style. This is Chevrolet puts the flanges on one of the bearings. It's actually on the rear main bearing. And so the crankshaft will actually have machine corresponding surfaces. So if the crank tries to move forward, this bearing here limits it. If it tries to move backwards, this bearing here limits it. So I want to show you something about a crank flange. So here's a main bearing. This is the rear main with 
the thrust surfaces there and there. And on this one, this bearing wiped out, and I actually caused this problem on an engine I was working on. Notice on the front side here, there's no signs of wear. It looks brand new. And these two little marks here and here, the purpose of those marks, if I can get it to focus, is to let oil get out on that flange surface so that when the crankshaft bumps it just lightly, and there's only about five, four to six thousandths clearance between the crank flange where it hits and this bearing. So it's lubricated. On the front side, notice it's all wiped out. Notice it's all um, sort of discolored and, and, and so on. This was an, a 97 or 96 Chevy Savannah van with a 5.7. This is a van I would put together as a work van. And when I assembled it, I made a mistake. And that is, um, I'm going to grab an oil pump so I can show you um, what I'm talking about. So this is a small block Chevy oil pump with an oil pump pickup screen right there. Okay, you can kind of see the screen down in there. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But in any case, um, when we install these, we want this to sit right on the bottom of the oil pan and it sucks oil right in through here and into that hole. Well, we typically tack them with a MIG welder to get them to stay in place. So if something bumps the pan, it doesn't knock the, the um, oil pickup up. Um, I used, what happened was, I, when I mocked it up, I ended up welding this at a slightly too far down angle, just enough that this, which bolts to the main cap of a small block Chevy, this is right on the rear cap, was actually causing the rear cap to twist forward just a little bit. So this bearing, the crank was being twisted against this bearing, and in literally 100 miles, destroyed the bearing. And... Uh, of course, I beat my head all over the place trying to figure out what was wrong. And it was real challenging for me to figure out what was wrong, but I eventually did. It actually ruined the crank, had to take the oil pan off. I was able to drop the crank out, put new bearings in, put the crank in. It cost me 150 bucks and a lot of time. So one half of these main bearings obviously fits up into the block and one fits down into the cap. Um, you'll notice that on many of these bearings, the one that's up in the block will have this groove. So oil comes through this hole in the block, spreads out on the surface. The crankshaft has a hole in it. When that crankshaft hole lines up with this channel, oil goes through the crank and lubricates, um, well, it lubricates the other side and it lubricates the rod bearings, believe it or not. So oil goes from the mains over to the rods. We'll get into that later, okay? So one bearing has a thrust surface like we've been talking about here that controls fore and aft thrust. That's forward and uh, uh, rearward thrust. So here's an engine bearing. Sorry. There it is. Just showing their construction, there are a whole series of different types of metals. Um, we usually call them tri-metal bearings with a steel backing to give the bearing all kinds of um, qualities. One, it needs to be rigid, so that's got that steel back. Um, it has another quality called embeddability. So if a little particle gets in the oil, it'll actually embed itself in the bearing rather than staying on the surface and damaging the crank. So we consider this a wearing replaceable part, whereas we really don't want to replace the crankshaft. Here's another look at some bearings with some oil holes and some oil grooves. And then this has thrust surfaces. So that's a thrust bearing to keep it from moving forward and rearward. Um, and like it says, oil holes and grooves allow oil to lubricate the bearings on, on the entire crankshaft. So our main bearing clearance is the space between the main journal and the main bearing insert. So we've got a, we have to make the crankshaft spin and float on a thin sheet of pressurized oil that separates the two, separates the journal from the bearing. And it's usually one and a half thousandths to two and a half thousandths. So here I go with a um, my Lexus V6 crankshaft here, and I'll tilt this down and we'll come back up. So here's our Lexus V6 crankshaft that, by the way, ran out of oil. You can see how this rod journal here is all black and blue. And I'll come down a little closer just so you can get a good look at it. So let me move the camera over there. So if you look at this, this journal here doesn't look like it's really in bad shape, does it? It looks pretty silvery. It looks good. And you can see the oil hole going right through the journal there, right down through. 
And then you look at this journal and it looks like it's really a mess. And then this one is just wiped out. It's all black and blue. That one obviously lost lubrication and it sees the engine. I'm just looking down here at some others. This one, you can see the bearing is still, there's actually a bearing still welded to that crank journal. This was a mess. That one's a mess. This one down here is okay. This one's a mess. So the main journals, one, two, three, four, don't look wiped out, but the rod journals are wiped out. And here's the reason why. Oil comes through the bearing insert, comes through the back of this main bearing here, goes into this hole, and there's a drill mark hole that's drilled down to the rods. So the mains get oil and the rods get oil last. So if you're going to get a failure, it's going to fail on the rods. And that's what happened. These rods got heated up. And it literally welded some of the bearings onto the rod journals, like this one here. And the consequence was, again, you can see that bearing there. Actually, it's this one. It's actually this one right here. So this is actually a piece of bearing right there. And it's welded onto that rod journal. And I don't know how well you can see it over there. But, oh, yeah, you can see the end of the bearing right there. There it is. And so this thing was seized, and we pulled it all apart. Okay, so the clearance between that main and rod journal um, is about one and a half to two and a half thousand. So that's the, the thickness of one hair on your head around the entire circumference of that journal. Okay, let's keep going. So... So here's a picture of a bottom end of an engine, which is the block. In this case, it's old school because it's got a camshaft with full round camshaft bearings. And I've got one here to show you. There's a camshaft bearing. That's what the camshaft spun inside the block. And that's how everything was until we started getting into the 80s when we had a lot more overhead cam stuff. There's the crank, kind of a funny looking crankshaft, main caps bearings, there's the thrust bearing, uh, rod piston rings and flywheels. So just a shot of our bottom end of an engine. So crankshaft oil seals. So we've got to seal the front and rear of an engine because the crank's got to poke out both sides so that we can drive the flywheel and flex plate on the back. And so we can have accessory drive and harmonic balancer on the front. We have to have seals both front and rear. The front main oil seal is always a one-piece annular seal pressed into the front. The reason why they get the, the name annular when it's a full circle, it's like a year's a, a cycle. That's how they get the idea of annular is a full year. Anyways, um, it's pressed into the front cover. The picture there shows a rear main seal here. Right down in there is a rear main seal, which in most, on all modern cases is one piece. And it's two-piece on old-school uh, engines. Whenever we do a clutch, we uh, often will replace the rear main seal while we have the chance because we're in there. And after 150,000 miles, it's conceivable it's going to start leaking a little bit of oil. So whenever we do a clutch, like I did a clutch this summer um, on a 2007 Subaru uh, Impreza WRX, um, I pulled the engine out to do a bunch of valve adjustments I had already told you about. While it was out, we did a clutch, and while we were doing the clutch, um, I replaced the rear main seal. Um, and it wasn't didn't look like it was really leaking, but it has 150,000 miles on it, so we want to do it while we have the chance because the labor is so much to get in there. Let's keep going. So a flywheel uh, is a manual transmission device that's going to uh, bolt to the rear of the crankshaft. This one happens to be lightened. That's why you have all these holes in it. To make it rev quicker so this would be a racing one but there's your bolt holes to the crank and then there's your teeth for the starter motor here's three alignment dowels for the clutch plate and disc that go on top of this plate surface <laughs> here's the functions of a flywheel so we're going to connect the crankshaft to the transmission or transaxle through a clutch or torque converter clutch on a manual training car torque converter on an automatic transmission car we're going to smooth engine power pulses because that um, flywheel has a, it's a large, heavy mass, if you will. 
and so it's going to smooth power pulses. And we also have a ring gear for starter motor engagement, and that's what the gear teeth are for right here. Okay. So um, I'm noticing, by the way, when I bring myself more into the picture, the the this camera is adjusting the lighting back and forth. So if I step out of the way, it tends to be a little more constant. So I'm here. I'm just pointing from over here. Anyways, that's the purpose of our flywheel. So we say a flywheel on a manual transmission car. We say a flex plate on an automatic transmission car. And I need to add a slide here. Um, I should add a slide um, with a picture of a flex plate and, and so on right there. Okay, so we did it. Here's a flex plate. I made a new slide. Here's a flex plate that's going to bolt to the crankshaft here through these holes. It's a thin steel plate. It's not the big thick one like like a flywheel. It mounts uh, the torque converters. The torque converter is going to bolt through, usually it's like, I think it's these, one, two, three, four. And, and then it's got a teeth for the flywheel to engage with. And also I, I grabbed this picture because look at the big piece of metal welded on here. This is a um, externally balanced, um, non-neutral weighted uh, flex plate. So this is providing some weight to, uh, for counterweighting on the crankshaft. Next, the connecting rod is going to connect the, the piston to the crankshaft. This one happens to be a full floating because you can see the bronze or um, bushing there on the small end. And we call this rod big end, rod small end. And this is obviously going to transfer combustion pressure to the crankshaft. Um, we have bolt coming through with nuts, and that's pretty typical. Or there are some that just have a bolt that threads right in. But more typical is a is a clamping force of a bolt with a nut. Okay. Let's see if we can get this thing to go forward. There we go. Here's another picture of a connecting rod. We call these an I-beam style rod. And this one has a rod bushing up there on the rod small end, so it is a, um, it is definitely a, uh, let me try and get the change of coloring, there it goes. Um, this one is definitely a full floating rod. You can see the rod bolt, and this one happens to have bearings in there, so you can see the bearings and how they are two-piece, and they have these little bearing tabs to lock the bearing from spinning in there. Um, all connecting rods on passenger cars are all made of, cast iron, um, only in top field drags to racing and things like that where you see an aluminum connecting rod. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got some rod bearings, and our rod bearings are going to go between the connecting rod, con rod for short. That's kind of an automotive um, common um, slang, con rod. So between the con rods or the connecting rods and the crankshaft journals, you're going to have bearings. You can see this one on the left looks pretty new, and this one obviously has significant damage. And I've got some really cool uh, rod bearings that have been pretty heavily damaged. So here's one that's basically brand new right here. And you can see that right in front of you there. There's the back of it. And then here's one that absolutely got destroyed because it lost lubrication. It was no longer floating on that uh, film of lubricating oil being a barrier between the crank and the rod and just destroyed it and that thing sounded like knock 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 it was like banging like a banshee just going crazy okay next um our rod bearing clearance is the distance for oil for that um, thin oil barrier that we're going to float on between the connecting rod journal um and the bearing and that's going to be usually one to two thousandths of an inch so even thinner than one hair of a on the head of your uh, on one hair of your head. So about two thousandths of an inch thick is most people's hair. One thousandth is thinner than I've ever seen. Okay, so very, very small clearance for oil on a connecting rod. Here's a piston. Uh, this is a cutaway of a piston. Um, you can see the ring grooves here and what's called the lands. The lands are the metal areas between the ring grooves. And here's the head of the piston here. You can see where the pin is going to slide through. Um, we call this the skirt. The lower area is the skirt. And you guys know that's transferring combustion pressure uh, to the connecting rod from the uh, and then to the crankshaft. So here's a pretty detailed picture of a piston with all kinds of um, sort of technical um, 
uh, names and so on. But like any piston, this one's a slight dome. It has ring grooves. It has ring lands. It has a, a way for oil to go back through and fall down through the center of the piston to the oil uh, for the uh, to the oil pan. So that's for the oil scraper uh, ring. Here's our skirt down here. The skirt's the part that fits most snugly to the piston. Usually, the um, if you come up about a half inch to three quarters of an inch from the bottom of the skirt, that's where we measure the clearance. And the clearance on a piston skirt to cylinder wall should be right around one and a half thousandths on a brand new engine. If you measure the piston up here across the ring lands at the top, it'll measure about 30 thousandths of an inch smaller. Um, so the piston is sort of tapered as it goes down. And that's just to reduce friction. So here's another picture, picture of the wrist pin going through a, a rod piston combination. We've cut the piston in half so you can see it better. Um, this would be a full floating. That red would be a bushing. Not all um, cars use that. So small Chevys. Here's a 5.7 liter Chevrolet. This one does not have a bushing in the small end. This is what we call a press fit piston. So what happens with a press fit piston like this one, this Lexus piston, the piston and wrist pin are pressed together. And so you'll notice that when I move the piston, the pin's moving with it. A full floating, actually, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. This actually has a bushing. There's actually a lock in there. I'm sorry, this is actually a full floating. So that the, the wrist pin and the piston are not pressed together. Um, they're actually moving independently. And there's a little tiny circlip in there. I don't know if you can see it that holds those two together. Here is a Ford 302 piston rod that's a press fit. So you'll notice that as the rod is moving, you can see the wrist pin is rotating as well. So the pin and the rod are pressed together. They're actually an interference fit. There is no clearance between. So we heat the small end of the rod up and we cool these down and we press them in with a special tool that we have. Um, so this is talking a little bit about piston clearance. That's the space between the skirt and the cylinder wall. That's going to allow a thin lubricating barrier um, so that the piston doesn't actually touch the cylinder wall and wear the cylinder wall out. Notice it says the skirt of the piston should taper so that the diameter at, uh, at C is from five to one and a half thousandths less than D. So this will be smaller up here than here, and this will be even smaller, about 30 thousandths up across the rings. So we usually measure right here in the distance between this and the inner bore of the cylinder. It's going to be about one and a half thousandths, so a very, very small um, shape. Notice it says the elliptical shape of the piston skirt should be 10 to 12 inches less in diameter from A to B. So, so, um, uh, so this is where the pin is. So this top portion of the skirt doesn't touch the cylinder. So the, it's really just this portion. So let me show you on the piston. So here's a piston here from a uh, 4.7 liter Toyota. And so you'll notice there really is no skirt over here on the side. You can look at it and see right there. The skirt is basically gone here and down here, and it's only here and here. So basically, you notice on this piston, you see this shiny spot here. There's it's where it's actually essentially coming in contact with the cylinder wall. When I say it comes in contact, there is oil between, but just this narrow strip in here is the only place where the piston's really being guided straight up and down. It might surprise you. The rings, of course, are uh, up here, and they are, are touching the cylinder walls, but on the piston itself, it's only here. You'll notice the shiny patch there, and on this side, it doesn't have, it has a little bit of shiny, but not nearly as much as this side. Well, this would be what's called the thrust side of the piston. So in other words, when this piston goes up, and you get an explosion, and the rod swings this way, it forces this piston this way, and that's that thrust surface that you have pushing against the cylinder wall. So we call this a major thrust and a minor thrust surface on that uh, piston. All right, let's continue here. And obviously, this egg shape of the piston, 
is going to allow for expansion so we can control our heat and we can kind of know what's going on there in terms of heat. All right, so piston rings are next and piston rings are going to seal our clearance between the outside of the piston and the cylinder wall. And they're really most important function, at least of these two compression rings, and we do always use two on gasoline pistons, is to be able to seal compression so that we make power. If we don't make compression, we don't make power. The higher the compression, the more power the engine makes. The oil control ring, which is this expander, and there's actually two little rails here, uh, oil scraper rails, are going to knock oil off the cylinder wall as the piston goes down. So if you look at this uh, Lexus piston, it's an 01 Lexus RX 300 3 liter, you can see the very, very thin uh, top and second compression rings. And then you can see this third oil scraper ring. So as the piston goes up, we get an explosion. We seal it on those two compression rings. As the piston goes down, we're scraping oil off the cylinder. And believe it or not, there's holes that allow the oil, and you really can't see them in there, but they're up in there. Um, there's holes way down up in there to let the oil drop right through the center of the piston back into the oil pan. So as the oil scraper goes down, oil goes through these holes, drops through the center of the piston. And uh, I don't know if you can see those. Yeah, you can see them on this one. If you actually look down in there, let's see, I could just see it a moment ago. So you can actually see a bright spot. I'm going to point to it on the screen here. There's a bright spot. Well, let me do it this way. It's a little harder than you think. There's some light holes down in here where my finger is there. You can see those little holes, the little light bright spots. Those are the drain back holes for the piston um, to drain oil back to the oil pan. So we're going to keep combustion pressure from entering the crankcase with these two compression rings. And we're going to keep oil from entering the combustion chamber with this oil control assembly. This next slide shows the piston with the rings kind of being expanded out there for you. You can see that the oil control ring is really a three-piece sandwich of two oil scraper rails and an expander there in the center. You can see the two top compression rings. So let's talk about compression rings for a moment. So they're going to prevent blow-by, um, which is compression pressure leaking into the crankcase. In other words, we don't want combustion going past the piston. I'll use this broken 4.7 liter. We don't want combustion up here getting past the piston rings and going down here in the crankshaft area that we call the crankcase. That would prevent, that would cause blow-by, blow seals out, and pollute the environment, etc. So combustion pressure is used, if you follow these red arrows here, to actually force the rings down and out against the cylinder wall to seal compression. So you'll notice they put often a chamfer on the ring, and this looks like it has lots of space in here. It really doesn't. It's very, very slight, but they're just exploding everything. This is the cylinder wall here. This is the piston here. The combustion pressure goes down and actually forces the ring out at this point, and we get a little bit of what's called ring twist, and that causes us to seal at a point, and that's done by design. Um, to help the compression ring seal better. There's actually more tech um, and engineering in the design of the rings and how they seal the cylinder wall than you might think. What baffles me is just so amazing that you can have an engine spinning so fast and still run my, my um, Toyota Tundra with a 3.4 liter V6 at 497,000 miles, and it's not using any oil. It's just incredible. So there you go. Oil rings. So they're going to prevent oil from getting into the combustion chamber. They are usually a two oil scrapers with an expander, so they're a three-piece design. And they're going to scrape excess oil off the cylinder wall. So in this picture here, you're seeing the gray um, cylinder wall there. The blue is the piston. The ring is this yellow right here and here. And then here's the hole through the expander where the oil can go back down and fall into the oil pan through the piston. Um, so it's just showing you how oil does get scraped off the cylinder walls and goes through the piston down into the oil pan. So next is ring gap. And ring gap is just the distance 
um, between the ends of the rings. And what this picture is showing is a, a technician after obviously freshly bored and honed. You can see the nice crosshatch pattern on the cylinder. All those fine scratches are caused by the hone that we want those there. Um, this feeler gauge is measuring between the ends of the rings, what we call ring end gap, so that we know that the tension of the ring on the cylinder wall is one, not excessive, and two, not too light. So we actually measure that ring gap when we put together an engine. This allows the ring to be compressed for installation, so there's a little bit of room to compress it for installation, and then to spread outward to aid in sealing. So we're gonna allow the ring to be compressed for installation and then we want it to be able to spread out with a little tension um, to aid in sealing. This uh, rings are made of cast iron, believe it or not. They do have molybdenum disulfide coatings many times or chrome coatings, but the rings themselves are made of cast iron. So cast iron, though it's pretty rigid, does have some flexibility to actually um, spread out and give some sealing effect on the cylinder walls. So uh, next what we're going to do is talk about the engine top end. 